Hey gang, Bo Bryant, restaurant consultant, author, chef, and restaurateur, here to bring you the next evolution in our conversations on food cost. First and foremost, let me just give a real heartfelt thank you to the tens of thousands of you who tuned in to our first training on food cost, the beginner's formula. If that was a way for everyone to get kind of set and get a better understanding about food cost, this conversation is going to take it to a whole nother level. This is a very, very big construct. It's a big conversation, and it's gonna require that we have an elegant design wrapped around how we share this information. So the best way we could see to do that was to reverse engineer based off of the best results and ratchet all the way down to how these best results are created. So in this deconstruction, we are going to start by identifying the biggest mistakes that concepts make. Next, we're gonna talk about what the best designed systems look like so that concepts can avoid making these mistakes. After that, we're gonna talk about how we can impact our entire spend. Food cost is a derivative of an expense line and I wanna show you the best practices on how to move that number down while moving the number of profitability up. All right, before we define the biggest a stake when it comes to food cost. Let's talk about why we even care about food cost so much in the first place. How we're identifying our food cost and how we're fixing our food cost problems is certainly one element within this big mistake that many restaurants make. But the bigger reason, I guess the reason that actually draws people to this conversation in the first place is because food cost is so inconsistent. And it's that inconsistency that leads to what is the cause of this biggest mistake that concepts make. And it's quite simply this, the silver bullet, if you will, identifying variance. Variance is the root cause of why food cost is so inconsistent. And the biggest mistake people make is not figuring out how to solve for variance. To the tune of about 9% in the industry, when we look at concepts that do not use a variance model to identify, quite simply, what their cost should have been versus what it actually was. The difference in between is variance. And so if a business or a restaurant is not measuring this or identifying it, then of course they're not gonna be able to impact it other than just throwing darts or guessing at strategies to fix food cost when it is very inconsistent. And by virtue of that, we could lead to a whole lot of other challenges. So. If we're going to deconstruct what the best in the business do and try to figure out why these folks are making three to four times more than the traditional independent, it would be because of an underdeveloped accounting structure. And that is probably derivative of a lack of understanding about how the entire infrastructure of this accounting system works. So let's begin with some really, really simple accounting concepts. Number one, we have the generally accepted accounting practices or GAP. These are the rules of accounting. And these rules are relatively simple and we're gonna get into them, but without good rules, we don't have good rationalization. The rules tell us how we're supposed to account for stuff. The rationalization tells us where and that is unique to us. If the rules are fixed, the rationalization is definitely something that we can use as a customizable approach to measure our business specific to our sales and our expenses. After we can customize the accounting structure specifically to us, then we can create categories and from those categories come definition. Once we have all of this stuff categorized and defined, now we can actually take our inventory counts, do what we call our capture, and from the capture, we have now built an accurate accounting system or a construct or platform. What we do with that is we control variance, we control the unpredictable, because now we have an opportunity to get or gather impactful outcomes. And those impactful outcomes come from our ability to analyze and to really analyze deep once we can analyze deep, because we've been created this great infrastructure with lots of layers and definition and customization, now we can actually start to do some prescriptive or predictive 
elements in our business. We can forecast. We can budget. We can create budgets because we see consistency in certain areas that we always spend. And so we can spend up to that limit instead of being shocked and re overreactive when we spend over that limit because the limit was never specified. Then we can also isolate. When we find issues, or at least to be able to find issues, we can now dig deep through all of these layers and levels of categorization and definition. Now it's easier to find where the specific problem came from, and that gives us a much more balanced attack when it comes to strategically impacting the reason why a specific cost or expense was out of line. That is done through an accounting model that we call a controlled environment. This is the general overarching rule for the best accounting practice. You create a controlled environment that gives you definition about the what, the where, the why, the how, and the when. We have to answer all of these questions and we have to do so very specifically in order to be able to minimize the unpredictable. So that unpredictable, of course, variance. So let's break down the variance concept really quick. Variance, again, is that difference between what something should have cost and what it actually cost. If we were to look at the definition of refinement, refinement is the process of removing impurities. Well, those impurities, everything that lies between Everything that is variance is what lies between what something should have been and what it turned out to be. So the best in the business understand that we've got to refine to eliminate those impurities. So let's start talking about one of the biggest impurities in the business when it comes to definition. The very concept of variance lies between two different terms, what we call actual cost and ideal cost. So the concept is oftentimes interchanged, but those words aren't meant to be interchanged. Ideal cost at a very, very high level is what something should have cost to make happen. According to our plan, according to our formula or our recipe, the actual cost is what it turned out to be. That is according to our expenses and our sales. So let's take a look at how each one of these works, what the formula looks like that's attached to it so that we can really understand where variance lies and how to start impacting it. So first let's talk about food costs. When most of us use the term food cost, what we're actually referring to is actual cost. Actual cost at a very, very high level, even if we're not talking about food, it's very, very simple. We can take our expenses divided by our sales and we can come up with our actual cost. The more we define the expenses against the defined sales, the more accurate we can be in a specific category and we'll talk about that breakdown in just a little bit. But for right now, let's focus on food cost. Here's the formula for being able to identify what actual cost is. And this formula is one of the first places that we are going to be able to impact and remove impurities. So this is one of those concepts that is sometimes hard for people to get their head around in the beginning. So let's talk about the two elements of identifying food cost. Number one is we have to calculate our inventory cost. We take our inventory cost and we divide that by our total sales, and in this particular example, food sales, and we get our actual food cost. But coming up with what our inventory cost is can be a little bit dynamic. So. We have to create that controlled environment. In order to create a controlled environment, I want to eliminate the variable, and the variable is going to be how much inventory I had left over. Any inventory that I purchased during a cycle but didn't use is considered a surplus. So follow along with me. At the end of last month or last period, I took my inventory so that I could turn that into accounting so that they could tell me what my food cost actual food cost was. That inventory value from the previous month is the exact same value in numbers that I use for my beginning inventory value because I stopped selling right after my last sale. I counted my inventory, which means that I counted it before my next series of sales, right? So my next cycle. So it carries over. It's the exact same thing. 
the assumption is that that surplus is now going to get used in this next cycle. So that's why I take that value to begin with, and then I take the total value of the additional food that I bought throughout this period or this cycle, and I add those two together. There is an assumption that that is all the product that I bought and used, so we call that our net purchases. Now, regardless of whether I used all of that or not, I'll be able to find that out by taking an end of period or end of month inventory. And when I take that, that inventory will have a value. That stuff, that again is a surplus. I purchased it but didn't use it, so I'm going to defer that off to next month. And in order to get an accurate inventory value, I'm gonna subtract that. So I take the value of my beginning purchases, my beginning inventory, plus everything that I bought throughout the cycle, and I have net purchases. Then I subtract anything that was left over, and now I have the true consumed value, the cost of everything that I bought and used. So from there, I can take this number, our food inventory value, and I can divide that by my total food sales, and I will get my actual food cost percentage. All right, now that we're all speaking the same language, when we talk about actual cost, let's add some definition to ideal cost. And ideal cost is a little bit more dynamic because there are two elements within the ideal cost construct. The first one is our plate cost. And that is exactly how much it costs us to build a specific plate or a recipe item that we sell. Next, we have our blended cost. And blended cost is a little bit more challenging, so let's break these down step by step. First, let's focus on plate cost. You can see in this illustration, I have a deconstructed recipe with visuals. This is my drunken chicken sandwich. We sell this for $10. The elements that go into it are as follows. I have one ounce of cream cheese. That cost me 26 cents in this recipe. I use one eighth of a whole avocado to put on the sandwich. That's gonna cost me 18 cents. Half an ounce of lettuce for two cents. One ounce of sliced tomato for five cents. Then I've got two pieces of bacon that cost me 44 cents. I have a homemade chicken burger patty, a six ounce portion that costs us $1.26 to make. And of course, when I add in my two slices of bread, I get an additional 38 cents. I round out this entire recipe with some French fries. We put seven ounces of French fries on the plate and that cost us 49 cents. So in order to build this entire recipe, in theory, if I were to execute it perfectly, no variation in my portion size, no issues with not accounting for my yield. For example, I backed out 10% of my entire cost of tomato so that I could core it and I divided my finished weight of my whole box of tomatoes by the total price I paid for it. So I got usable weight. All of my theory is solid. This is what we should be able to perform against. If we do, it will cost us $3.08 for this cycle to sell this $10 chicken, which gives us a 30 point 8% food cost. Now, there's one big huge element of variance that always ends up popping in here, and that is the ambiguous. So we'll talk about some rules as it applies to food cost, but I'm gonna start sowing the seed right here. You see how my french fries have that little two ounce ramekin of ketchup? That would not go into the recipe because I serve ketchup on the table. And because of that, if I can't account for through my sales, where every ounce of product went, then it's not really a sales cost. It is more of a supply cost or what we call a controlled expense. And we'll get into that breakdown in just a little bit, but I'd like you to wrap your head around it. If I put that two ounce portion or ramekin of ketchup on the plate, I know that it cost me two cents, or excuse me, two ounces cost me eight cents, but what I don't know is how much ketchup they used at the table. So do I even bother? My logic is I back it out and we'll explain that in just a little bit. That is to create this controlled environment. I only want to account for what I can definitively and always say I used against what I purchased. All right, after ideal cost, we have to move to our ideal blended cost. Now, the reason why we do blended costs or the reason why blended cost is so critical is because most of us sell more than just one item. So I've got to figure out how much every item cost me 
I've got to add up the total for all those costs and I've got to be able to divide that by my sales to figure out what my ideal blended cost should have been. Now, if that seems a little hard to get your head around, we'll go through this in a relatively simple illustration. So at my concept, my fictitious concept, I sell four items and four items only, and you can only buy them a la carte. Not a recommendation for a business model, just to use for this illustration. So I have a burger that I sold 200 of, and I did it at a 32% food cost, ideally. I have an order of french fries. We sold 142 of those at an 18% ideal cost, and I sold 88 sodas at a 21% ideal cost, 39 cheesecakes at a 24% ideal cost. So in order to figure out my ideal blended cost, I have to take the units sold of each individual item multiplied by its sell price. That gives me my sales total for that item. I do that for all four of these items and I get my total sales. Next, I look at what the cost was for each item. I multiply the cost by the number of units sold and I get my total cost to sell that item. Once I add up my total cost to sell all the items and my total cost for all my sales, I can divide the two and get my blended food cost percentage according to ideal or theoretical. So you can see that while the burger might have been alarming at 32% cost and the fries might have been very exciting at an 18% cost, the way they all compressed together gave me, by rounding up, a 28% ideal blended food cost. So that's ideal blended food cost. Now that we understand the difference between actual and ideal, now we can reveal the formula for calculating variance cost. I start with my blended ideal cost what that total number was in theory to sell everything that I sold. I subtract that cost from my actual cost to arrive at my variance cost. Now I can take my variance cost and I can divide that by my total actual cost and the difference between the two is going to show me what my variance percentage was. And again, this is that place where most folks in the industry suffer from a nine point deficit. So if you're running a 35%, you should have actually been running a 26%. That's what it means. So sometimes with food costs, we can get kind of excited because we're just comparing these blanket numbers of food costs. Well, 30% is supposed to be great or 28 is supposed to be great. Uh, according to who and according to what? If we're not comparing that against ourselves and what we should have actually done because we measured it and we knew, then anything that we feel great about with food cost in the absence of awareness with variance is just false hope or false excitement. And we'll get into the breakdown about how to make sure we are accounting for this accurately and measurably every single time. So let's do that by talking about the construct of accounting and let's lay out the rules. In order for us to truly impact food cost, we need to go from that bubble that we live in, that is food cost, labor cost, prime cost, and we have to be able to take a step back and look at the big picture. This big picture is how we are informed relative to how everything works and how we can impact and control it, and that is set forth to us by some rules or an accounting construct. Now, if you look at the accounting construct, I have an onion on here. That's not because accounting is meant to make you cry, even though it does get most of us down. Uh, it's the onion that's symbolic for the layers and how accounting works is like peeling back the layers of an onion. So the very, very top line principle of accounting begins with what is called a balance sheet. So a balance sheet uh, is also known as a general ledger. And this general ledger puts all of our dollar amounts in two buckets on opposing sides. On the one side, we have what we call our assets, things that are worth money. On the other side, we have our liabilities. And those are things that cost money. Now, we record those separately because they have a different impact. One's a positive impact, one's a negative impact. The easiest way to describe a, a balance sheet would just be consider that one side is your revenue and the other side is your expense. We have to attach detail and definition to as many different pieces as we can categorize. And the more we can categorize, the more accuracy we can get. This is done through a model in the industry called a chart of accounts or general ledger codes. 
and again has two buckets. It defines everything sales. So we have all of our revenue categories and then all of our sub revenue categories. So we can look and really drill down on all the different things that we sell or we can start at a very high level and look at those. Then we have our expenses and our expenses are on the other side. We have our categories for expenses and then we have our subcategories. So further detail. The byproduct of this construct when we count for our inventory and we do all of our figuring on food costs and all that stuff comes out of what's called a P&L or a profit and loss statement. A profit and loss statement has a high level, kind of a snapshot view that we call a summary P&L. That summary P&L allows us to discern opportunities, challenges, or things that worked at a real, real quick glance. But when we find those things that are off, when those things that didn't perform how we thought they would, or there's some kind of surprise, that takes us to the next level. And the reason why we have all this definition is so that we can look at a detailed P&L. And the detailed P&L will help us dive in very, very specifically to trace back where we had inconsistency or variance or an unexpected outcome. So if that's the accounting construct, here's a good snapshot of what the summary P&L looks like. This is pretty basic and I've kind of broken it down into two sides. In one side, I have basically my direct sales and my direct cost in order to appease those sales. On the other side, I had more of those things that were harder to measure. They are still expenses, but I don't know how I can quantify how much expense went into every single item that I sold. So if you look at a P&L that way, it'll give you a good idea. Now, if I want that further level of detail, I can expand the eye chart that is the detailed P&L. We'll talk about more on this a little bit later, but for right now, just wanna have a high level awareness of what the accounting construct looks like and understanding that there are rules and some of those rules need to be followed. There are also elements within those rules that are very customizable to us. Some can be flexed, some can be bent, and some can even be broken. And it's not because we're told what these rules have to be, it's we're giving some instruction and then it all comes down to interpretation. So in order for interpretation to work for us, we have to be able to look at our own business and rationalize where different things should and would fall. Okay, so the first rule of rationalization, let's look at how we rationally apply sales and expense. So in this illustration of a dollar up here, I want you to consider that one dollar represents a sale. That's money we took collected for something that we sold. Now here is the rule that applies to that dollar and how we account for that dollar. A dollar of revenue goes in the drawer. I have to take 29 cents of that dollar out of the drawer to pay for food and beverage cost on average. I have to take 27 cents out of the drawer to pay for my labor cost. Then I've got 16 cents, that's also gotta come out of the drawer and that's gonna pay for my expenses that I can control. Next I have the expenses that I can't control. They're fixed, they're not going to change. So I don't want those blended in another bucket. I wanna separate those so I can kind of set them aside. This is the known, this is my nut. This is what I have to cover every single month in order to be able to just break even before buying anything or selling anything. So that's fixed cost. That leaves us an additional 18 cents in the drawer and that's our profit. So this actual example right here is a living, breathing example that comes from our big multi-unit independent concepts that are the most profitable of anybody that we've seen. And it's a pretty large sampling. We've worked with thousands and thousands of individual units representing hundreds of concepts, and they all are in the space called emerging concepts. And those are growing chains that are very profitable, um, but not big corporate concepts. So let's rationalize this dollar just a little bit further. There is a big element within our cost of goods and our labor, and that is what we call prime cost. The big challenge in this industry when it comes to trying to create or identify a baseline is what lives right here in this space. So let's talk about that. If you've done any independent research or talk to friends or talk to mentors in the industry to try to figure out what should a good food cost be? We have to ask, what are we really trying to assess 
by asking that question. We talked just a minute ago about how could anybody know what a good food cost for you should be if they don't know what your current ideal blended cost is. So we talk in vagaries and we hope that that 28% or 29% food cost is good. But I'd like to throw a little salt on that. If you look at food cost, let's say I have an Italian restaurant on one corner and an Italian restaurant on the other corner. They both have a prime cost of about 55%. But if they were just to exchange and ask each other, hey, what's your food cost? The owner of Concept A would tell the owner of Concept B that, hey, I run a 21% food cost. Now, Concept B is scratching his head saying, how can that be possible? I run a 32% food cost. Well, that all boils down to how we use the product. So Concept A is running a 22% food cost because he's making his pasta from scratch, his dough from scratch. He's buying block cheese and shredding it. He's making his marinara from scratch. Everything is from a commodity level product. That product, whole bags of flour, whole blocks of cheese, whole cases of eggs, all that stuff is very inexpensive because it hasn't been managed by a manufacturer. No labor has been put into it. On the flip side, the gentleman over here running in the 30% food cost range is buying all of his stuff pre-made. His dough is pre-sheeted, his cheese is pre-shredded, his marinara comes in a can. Well, yeah, there's going to be a big difference in the way they purchase this product. But the flip, the inverse is true. The guy who's buying all the commodity level product is going to have to put his own labor into shredding the cheese, making the sauce, making the dough, making the pasta. Over here at Concept B, he should have a much lower labor cost because all that labor came delivered to him. So now it's really just assembly and what we call RTU, ready to use product. So he's assembling it and selling it, should have a much lower burden of labor. So that's why we look at prime cost, to at least get a baseline comparison. Okay, so now that we've rationalized the revenue and the expense, now we need to look at each segment of our expense and even our revenue and add more definition to it. And the reason why we want to add that definition is so that we can get more surgical in our view when it comes to being able to identify what went wrong. So let's start with sales. We don't just call it all sales, we want to break the sales down into different segments so that we can identify A, where we have better profitability in certain areas or where we have worse profitability, uh, where we have higher need for labor, lower need for labor, etc. So I'm going to identify my sales in this example as I've got food, I've got beverage, I've got liquor, beer, wine, and I have other operating income. I have a gumball machine in the front of my store and I make money every month when the guy comes to add more gumballs and clean out the change. That will come full circle in just a minute. Now when I look at the next segment, that was my revenue, now I want to create more definition and subcategories to my cost of goods. So I'm going to break my cost of goods down into food, beverage, liquor, beer, wine. You can see I'm accounting for what I bought similarly to accounting what I sold. I want to compare the two separate from everything so that I can get specific information in their unique segmentation. Now you'll notice in my direct cost of goods here that I do not have a cost of goods attached to my operating income. That is because that piece of equipment for the gumball machine is not something I pay for. Somebody gives me a cut in order for me to allow them to have that in my store. I have no expense, I just get revenue. I have to account for the revenue, but I don't just blend that into food because it wasn't something I paid for. So it could artificially inflate, or excuse me, deflate my food costs because I'm accounting for sales that don't have an account for purchases. That's why I separate them all out so I can get good clean values. That's also why I don't put it into my cost of goods because I don't pay anything for it. This is an incredible illustration of how we can uniquely customize our P&L and our definitions to look according to our business. Let's take it a step further now. Let's look at labor. This is how the best in the industry track and measure labor so that they can separate out, separate out the anomalies, the inconsistencies. So when I track labor, it's very common, a lot of people will just look at what their management cost is and what their hourly employee cost is. We like to take this a step further. I like to break out my management, then I have front of house staff, which is hourly, 
training front of the house staff, back of the house staff, and training back of the house staff. Then I have my employee benefits. Employee benefits should be controllable, but relatively the same. Back of the house training, that's something that could vary from any different period to another. So I'm going to want to know if the reason why I took a higher prime cost was because we had turnover the month before, which led to a higher run rate of overtime, which cost me the same amount of people and hours, but now it cost me 50% more after 40 hours. The same is true, imagine that same month, that I also hired some trainees so that I wouldn't have to keep paying for this burden of overtime. Well, now I've got duplication in people. I've got two people in one section, one guy working and training, the other guy watching and learning. So if I can't segment these to identify why or where these big spikes came from, I might react in a way that's not terribly informed and it might end up creating what we see so often is a reaction that will fix a problem that creates more problems below it. If I just assumed my food cost was high because I didn't account for any variables, I could make the mistake of buying a cheaper product. Uh, good in the short term, bad in the long term. Could end up disrupting my entire sales expectation because now guests are upset because they feel like we're cutting corners. Or if my food cost was high and I didn't know why or where all this came from, I could just put a blanket price increase on my menu. I could probably end up getting the exact same result as before. It fixed food cost temporarily, but it ended up driving my sales down because the guests thought I changed what our value proposition to them was. This is why we want to ratchet down. Let's just round out the cycle real quick, talk about controlled expense. I'm going to break this down. There are all kinds of subcategories underneath our controlled expenses. Controlled expense is the rule, how we define the buckets underneath it and what we put into it, that's up to us. How we expand further on those buckets is also up to us and I will talk to you about some rules that we use when it comes to accounting for that stuff. Finally, we've got those fixed expenses. Those are things historically that aren't going to change. My rent is fixed. Yet, I might have a percentage of rent to sales where if I sell over a certain amount, I pay a percentage based on what I sold. But for the most part, let's just assume this is fixed and it's relatively simple. I'm playing a, fat, a flat fee every single month and that is always gonna be that way until I renew my contract and then it's going to be that way until that one expires, so on. That finally leaves us with the profitability. So, hopefully this big picture is starting to come into focus and the reason why we're managing all of our revenue and expenses with all this level of detail is starting to form and the importance for it is starting to create some insight for you. The more we can do this, the more we can isolate and eliminate variance. We're still gonna have it, but it'll be more predictable, more easy to identify, and more easy to impact. So now let's talk about how we categorize that custom categorization to get an even deeper layer of the onion exposed. The concept of the controlled environment is something that we can't emphasize enough. This Lord Kelvin had a tremendous quote that says, to measure is to know. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So this is the reason why we're gonna add all of these different categories and segmentations. Let's start with a simple illustration of why we need the segmentation. So we talked about blended ideal cost. Now I'd like you to look at the sales category and why that's so important. I'm not going to run the same cost for all of my food as a category as I am going to on beverage, liquor, beer, and wine. For the industry, we know there's some truths. Food cost is gonna run somewhere between 26 and 30%, let's say. I know that my soft beverage sales are gonna run somewhere between 18 and 22. I know that my beer sales are going to run somewhere between 20 and 23, my wine, 20 and 25. Uh, so I don't want to look at all of that as a whole. I want to separate it and identify how it all blends together. So within food, in my food sales, I am going to get even more specific because my food is not just all the same. It's different. I have three different concepts within my four walls. I have my traditional dining room service, but then I also have catering box lunch business that has a completely different recipe cost than what my plated food does. 
And then finally, I have my event sales. My event sales are complete different recipes. Again, everything is family style or buffet style for my event sales. It's stuff that's off menu, the portions might be bigger, the offering might be wider. So I want to rationalize all three of these separately. And then we're going to get really tricky. Within my sales, I also want to account for my comps, my discounts, and my voids. Because when I balance my sales at the end of the month, I might be doing this for a handful of reasons. So now I'm going to introduce a third concept of cost. So we have actual cost. Then we have ideal blended cost. In between, we have a concept called adjusted cost. And here's how and where adjusted cost would work. In my restaurant, I run three unique marketing campaigns a month. I run one model through social media. I do another one that's all viral word of mouth, which is password marketing. And then I do a third one, which is for charities. I have budgets for how much I'm going to spend on those. And I also have a forecast for what I think I'm going to get on those in return an ROI. The return on my investment is critical and that's the biggest reason why I separate these three buckets. If I know that one bucket is for social media, I can look at how much I spent on it and I can see how much revenue that generated for me and I can apply a value that is called ROI. I can do that for all three of them and because of that measurement, I can now identify which ones I should do more of, which ones I need to kind of tweak or correct and maybe which ones I should abandon so that I can take more of the successful ones and put them in their slot. Not intentionally giving you a marketing and branding lesson, but here's the consideration for adjusted cost. If I am incenting any level of my leadership or culinary team for their food cost, then I have to be accountable to what we should have sold and what they actually purchased. So we should have sold is what we have for total sales before discounts or comps. Uh, well, before discounts. Comps are another story. We'll talk about that in one second. The discount is what I gave away, and that didn't reduce the cost of purchases, it just reduced the cost at what we sell it at. So in order to have an accurate depiction of what my guys in the kitchen did, I only wanna look at total sales divided by actual purchase inventory value. Now, we could talk about comps. Comps are a bit different. Comps, I'm gonna do some adjustment on comps too. If I had a bunch of comps in the front of the house, to me, that was not the fault of my kitchen guys. Those were service errors or even a guest walkout. The guys in the back can't control that. So I'm not going to charge that against them. I'm just gonna take my total sales, less my discounts, and less those service error comps. That's product that was made, so we lost the food, we also paid for the food, but I'm trying to offset that loss by backing out those comps against my guys. Now, if my guys in the back, guys and girls in the back, had an issue where they were creating errors, they were making food inaccurately. Go back to that turnover scenario. I had guys working overtime, they're making mistakes because they were getting burnt out. We identified that, so we brought in help. Now they're training people. Those trainees are making mistakes. Those trainees are consuming food and we have to comp that. They have to taste stuff and know what it's supposed to be like. So those actual errors or impacts are a direct related kitchen expense. So I am not going to back that out of total sales when I calculate food cost. And that's why I separate all of these. It's a controlled environment that allows me to identify where my deficits and gaps are. Now, I could take a look at this exact same concept through the entire category of beverages and I apply the same logic. Now here's some more customization. I used to live in a state where we owned a restaurant and it was illegal to give people a coupon for a free drink. Because of that, we just took discounts completely out. We could comp things and we could of course void things. The voids were the items that weren't made, but they were rang in. So we don't have to do any sales adjustment, we just have to correct the error for the overring. On the comps though, again, I wanna look at what my bartenders comped, what my servers comped, and certainly shouldn't have too much that my kitchen comped, but occasionally I will have kitchen comps if I'm cooking with wine or beer. So I don't wanna penalize my bar staff for comps that weren't affected or weren't directly related to them. So that's a big picture of 
uh, the big drill down cycle to get all of this definition. All right, so one of the big culprits in variance is a concept we also have to have our head around and understand what we're doing to impact it positively or negatively. So awareness will create the change in this category, and that is our category sales mix. Revenue as a portion of sales by category. Let me explain what that means. If we look at that sales dollar again, take a look at how I account at a very deep level for the product that I sell. Remember how I broke out my dining room sales, my catering sales, and my event sales? In the sub-segment of my dining room sales, I sell entrees. 60 cents on every dollar that comes into the dining room is spent on our entrees. 12 cents of every dollar is spent on soda. The dessert sales have a 10% cost of sales or blend of sales and 18 cents of every dollar that comes into the dining room is spent on beer. If you notice all the different costs of the breakdown of this dollar, you will see why this is important that we segment this as well. Think about it like this. If month after month I run a very similar blend of the way that all my food off of the menu sells, then there shouldn't be too much variation. But if all of a sudden I have a run in one particular category that has a higher cost, it's going to skew my entire food cost percentage. So I have to be mindful of identifying this. And so we do this with some additional rationalization. And that happens in our POS system. We want to make sure that we have a detailed product mix or what you might hear, hear as a P mix. So a P mix is what shows us what we sold by categories on our menu and what we sold by item within that category. So we use those totals to be able to capture and identify what our blended cost is, but we also use the output from that report to be able to identify if there were changes within the blend of the revenue spend by category. So that illustration takes us back to the previous slide. When I add up my total impact of sales or cost, blended cost of sales by a category and I figure out what its ideal blended cost is by category, I can now look at what was the total sales mix throughout my entire menu and did that change. Those changes could improve or decrease profitability and if we're not paying attention to it, we're not going to know where it came from. Let's say that we do have an impact in our food cost because a category. So let's say I have burgers as one category and pastas as a category. I'm going to want to also refine the products that I buy so that I can get indicators for why the food cost in a specific category was higher one month over the next or if it blended different why that had a negative impact on the blend. Now let's talk about another common area that is often not refined and one that we're going to need to refine. Sometimes people will allude to their food cost uh, and accidentally call it food cost when they meant cost of goods or cost of goods sold. Now that's a very, very important word. I'm going to break out why cost of goods sold is such a bad thing to look at. At a very high level, it's great, but it is going to have the most variance in it of any item that's why we want to segment specifically. So remember, if we're going to count our sales according to food, beer, and wine, we also want to track our purchases according to food, beer, and wine. So cost of sales, you should probably throw that aside because I promise you there's a lot of negative and improperly accounted for variance in that category. So when I look at my cost of sales, let's just look at food specifically. In my food, how I capture and record what I purchased, I'm not just going to call it all food because all food has a different impact. I, like most restaurants, run an 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the items that I buy cost me 80% of the dollars that I spend in purchases. So I want to break out my categories so that I can identify where that spend variance is coming from. So you can see here I've got beef, I've got pork, I've got seafood, poultry, produce, bakery, dairy, grocery, and dry goods. As a general rule, if I can subcategorize something and break it out and it impacts 
3% or more of my total purchases, then I'm going to rationalize that. A big part of the reason why I've broken these down too is because if you look at the top six or seven, they are commodity-based items. They change every single week. A more generic category like grocery, I'm not as concerned about because the prices don't move as much. It can be a bigger category, and I don't buy as much product in dollars in that category as I do in some of these other categories. So the more I can define it, the more I can inspect and get down to the granular level of detail when I'm tracing back a negative impact. I'm going to apply the same logic to my beverage. So when I look at liquor, beer, and wine, I'm going to define those a little bit more. I'm going to define like beer, for example, I sell a pretty equal blend of draft of our own beer that we brew in house and of the bottled beer that I buy. So I want to look at what the cost is to each one of those subcategories so I can figure out what's working, what's not, where, if it's got a higher cost, should I try to promote the items that have a lower cost? And all of this starts blending in and giving us insight towards a concept called menu engineering and menu management. Now let's talk about this concept of expense and let's drill down a little deeper. We have cost of goods and we have expenses. Now I gave you the illustration about ketchup and ketchup was one of those examples where I don't know how much people are using. I can't account for it. If I can't account where, for where every single ounce went, then I will have no idea what my ideal should have been. It's ambiguous. I have to take those ambiguous items and I have to remove them. So this is how we rationalize cost of goods versus expenses. Take a look at this illustration. My cost of goods, a beer is a cost of good, and I'm gonna put it in my beer cost when I go to look at my beer sales. Same thing with my food cost, my cost of goods, subcategorized under food cost, I know that bun, how many of them I sold, because I have sales and recipes to substantiate it. My LTO, I take a lettuce, tomato, onion setup for every burger that we do, so I can quantify exactly how much of that I sold, and because of that, I should know exactly how much I purchased and used. Next, my french fries. If I'm controlling the portion according to the recipe, and I'm not having a lot of variance, then I should be able to account for how much every single potato cost me to buy and sell. And then on the flip side, where it gets a bit tricky, expenses. Ketchup, like we talked about. I have no idea. Some tables don't use it at all. Some people use excess and some people use a moderate amount. I've got dipping oil on the table or vinegar and oil for salads. It just stays on the table all the time. How could I put that under food cost or a cost of goods when I can't measure or quantify how much of it I should have or shouldn't have used? Next, I have paper. Paper and packaging. If I don't wrap every single item the same way when it's to dine in or to dine out, and I don't have different recipes for to-go food and to-stay food, then this is anomalous as well. Maybe I had a larger percentage of sales this month in my to-go food than I did in my in-dining room sit-down experience. If that's the case, but I don't measure it accordingly, then I can't add this in to the recipe cost or to the cost of goods. All right, so I'm gonna insulate that whole concept with one of the biggest and most critical rules as it applies to calculating beverage cost, food cost, liquor cost, doesn't matter. This is a universal rule. When we use the statement cost of goods sold, that would imply that we could account for what went into what was sold. If we don't charge for it, then it's not a cost of goods sold. If we don't always charge for it, it's not a cost of goods sold. So here's the breakdown in this rationalization. Oftentimes, people will build their ideal food cost based on their menu, when instead they should be doing it based on their P mix, their product mix. That is a list of every single item that you sell in your POS system. You would have to print that report and put a check mark next to every single item that you sell that A, it has a recipe, that it has a cost, because you have to pay something in order to give this thing away, that it has consistency. There's not a difference between a small and a large. Uh, if there is, it's accounted for in the POS system. And finally, it has to have a quantity. It has to have a number that's tracked so we know how many there were. When we say that this item has to have a price, understand zero is a price. 
If it's got a price, it's got a cost, we can account for how many are sold and exactly how much is sold to satisfy that sale, then it can go into a cost of goods sold. If it doesn't have these four elements, then it is not a cost of goods, it is a controllable expense. So we'll break that down, but this is categorically what we see as one of the biggest mistakes when it comes to accuracy in calculating blended cost and then being able to identify variance. My menu might have 20 items on it. My PMIX report probably has 60. So I need to be accountable to everything I sell, not everything that I have menued. Okay, now let's put that in action. So I've got my cost of goods versus my expenses. Beer cost, I account for as beer cost. My bun, I throw that into my bakery category. Beef, I put that into my beef category. The LTO, I put into my produce category. All this stuff that I buy ends up over in this category so I know where I spent it. All of that falls under cost of goods and you can see how we broke out the cost of goods. Again, right here are all the categories. Every time I buy something, it gets recorded and accounted for under its respective uh, budget line or general ledger line. Now, let's look at the other side. I have all this different tableware that I have to have in order to sell my food. I've got glassware. Glassware in my particular concept is something that we spend more than 3% on when it comes to our entire expense, controllable expense line, so we break it out and give it its own category. Table consumables. We spend more than 3% total in this entire category on table consumables, so we create its own line. So table consumables, ketchup, salt, pepper, sugar, jam, jelly. Can't put it in cost of goods because I have no idea exactly how many I should have sold when I look at recipes and I back that out through sales. So that is a controllable expense. Uh, butter, any type of side dish or dressing, dipping sauce, anything that you give away for free or let people have more of, if you're not going back to the POS and punching it in, even if it's a zero cost, then it's gonna fall in that category. Uh, here's another example, my table and service wear. So I've got sugar caddies, I've got my cruet for my wine and vinegar, I've got my tableware, silverware, stuff that only gets used in the front of the house. This is an expense line. But the beauty of all these expense lines are when I see them, I can start to see an emerging theme or a reoccurring theme appear, and that's how I'm able to extract and create budgets for people. And we'll get into how to control budgets in just a minute. Next, I've got paper and packaging. I'm not putting that into food costs because I don't present it in the same paper and packaging for every application. So it's ambiguous, can't account for it, it goes over here. It is such a big line, I definitely separate that out as one unique line that I count for under my controllable expense. And here is a list of all of the random and unique things I put into my controllable expense. The one that's most interesting and the one that seems to throw people off is this last one, I've got cooking fuel, my fry shortening. I spend more than 2% for an item that I can't account for how much of it I use, so it goes into its own expense line. I look at cooking oil or shortening the same as I look at gas or the same as I look at electric heat. It is a medium for cooking. That's all it does is cook, it's a fuel. So I'm gonna count it as such, but I'm not gonna put it in utilities. I'm going to put it in controllable expense because it has a much wider range of control. And I'm going to give you a true story, an example that happened in one of my restaurants. I had a general manager who had decided to switch our fryer shortening because we were sold the advantages of this longer lasting, cleaner, slower to break down, high oleic cotton canola blend oil. We were using a commodity shortening and this was at my wing restaurant. We had eight fryers. Did over a million two in sales a year out of a thousand little square feet. That's a crazy volume running through those fryers. Pretty much 90% of everything we sold was wings. So we had the shortening, we switched it. It was about 40%, 30% more in cost, but we needed, it lasted 40% longer. So we had an average budget line of $2,000 in shortening. And imagine my surprise when we got our P&L and I saw that there was 35% or $3,500 in expense on that shortening line. Well, I know I'm 
controlling my environment and all these best practices, what the heck happened? I go and drill in and I find out that while we made the switch from the inexpensive oil to the more expensive oil, that was supposed to last 40% longer, we weren't changing it with any different frequency. We were dumping the oil in the exact same amount of time as we used the other oil. That habit didn't get coached or trained to, and so we lost a whole ton of money with product that should have lasted longer. We didn't use it to its fully optimized capacity. And if I hadn't broken that down, I would have never found that crazy expense, and I probably would have just come down hard on the guys in the kitchen, or on the general manager who made the decision to switch the product. So that's one of these perfect illustrations of why we break things down so much and the logic behind customizing all of our general ledger codes into our expanded P&L detail so that we can find the challenges timely and impact them immediately. Okay, so continuing with this drill down of definition and rationalization, I'm going to show you how the best in the industry manage more lines within this controlled expense. So I had pointed out the shortening. Now we're going to talk about all of these different buckets that we do and how we rationalize them. I have bar consumables. I've got fruits, uh, olives, cherries, that type of stuff that we buy from our food service provider, never use in the kitchen. When that stuff comes in on an invoice, I want it to go over to the cost side of the bar, not the cost side or the expense side of the restaurant under cost of goods. Next, I have my bar utensils and supplies. Glassware separate, remember, within this whole category, 3% is glassware, so I separate that out, but my muddlers, my shakers, my pour mats, all of the different supplies and utensils and stuff that we use back behind the bar, I don't want that getting all lumped in together for the entire restaurant because I have my front of the house who uses their own supplies, back of the house that uses their own unique supplies, and the bar that uses their own supplies. All of this factors into my profitability, so when I can find a theme, then I can capture a budget. When I can capture a budget, I can even try to encourage my guys or incent my guys to deliver below budget, certainly not to go above budget unless it has manager's approval. And so now I'm controlling cost. Again, why we can call it controlled cost. And when I do so with a budget, my guys should constantly be subtracting what they purchased from their budget line so they have a run in tally on what their budgeted amount is. We'll get into some detail and some great practice on how to manage that. But these are some of those categories. Cleaning supplies. I'm going to break out cleaning supplies and hold it completely separate. That's one whole different controlled piece. Freight and fuel surcharge. This, I have one vendor that charges me a fuel surcharge. So I want to look at that and account for it as a standard line until I get frustrated enough that I'm either going to ask them to remove it or I'm going to look at other vendors that don't charge that because I feel like the value of my relationship is worth more than five extra bucks on a load. Uh, glassware, we talked about guest supplies. So guest supplies are those random things that shouldn't really apply to the back of the house or the front of the house or the bar, and we put those into that category. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail on that. Cooking fuel, we talked about. Paper and packaging, we've also talked about. Tableware and serviceware, this is my front of the house dining room supplies. Table consumables, again, those are those coffee creamers, the Jams, jellies, butters, salt, pepper, sugar, short, or all that bucket of stuff that goes over there that's ambiguous, those are my table consumables. So that is how I break down and rationalize my controlled expense. Now let's take a deeper dive into labor. When I showed labor, I do it by management, front of the house training, back of the house, and back of the house training. Now I can dive even deeper by looking at all of the specific positions. That way I can catch spikes or hiccups. And again, this isn't directly related to food cost, but this is that prime cost concept. And that's why I'm going into so much detail when it comes to the labor cost. Uh, moving on, let's look at some of the fixed expense just so that we're aware of what is fully spelled out in those categories. So yeah, occupancy cost, here's an interesting uh, rule of thumb for occupancy cost. As a best practice, occupancy cost should be 10% or less of total sales. If it's more than that, you have a sales problem. You're not generating enough sales to make that 10%. If, let's say, you have a very, very busy restaurant that 
still has an occupancy cost higher than 10%, then you may not have a sales problem. You might have a rent problem. Another good rule of thumb to know, rent should be 7% of total sales or less. So the best and easiest way to figure that out, just give you a real quick formula for that off the cuff. If you take your total sales and divide your total sales by 12, you would get what your average monthly sales are. Then if you took and divided that total monthly sales number by 100, you would get what 1% of sales looks like. Now multiply that by seven to see what your ideal monthly rent should be. If you're performing better than that, you're good. If you're performing worse than that, you either have a sales problem or a rent problem. So neat little rule of thumb, not gonna spend a whole lot of time in this category, but I did wanna illustrate everything that goes into occupancy cost and these other two categories for fixed cost. Now, the big game changer, the big mind blower. One of the biggest challenges with accounting is the amount of manual energy and effort that has to go into it. So when we look at our total expenses, uh, we've got our cost of goods, we've got our controlled expenses, we have our labor cost and our fixed cost. When we look at the product that we buy, almost everything that we purchase from a vendor is gonna fall into the top two categories, our cost of goods or our controlled expenses. Cost of goods, we can measure them, account for them, know exactly based on what we sold, how much we should have used. That's a direct cost related to food cost, beverage cost, and liquor cost. That indirect expense, we buy it, but we can't quantify it, or it's an enhancement to the overall sale, but we can't necessarily break it down towards a consumed amount that's predictable every time. We'll call that controlled. So let's take a look at our entire master product guide, everything that we buy reoccurring from a vendor. On this list, we need to be able to break down every single thing that we buy and assign a GL code to it. Physically, print this off and call it out. Here's the GL code number. It falls under cost of goods sold under the subcategory of food, under the defined subcategory of dairy, of beef, of pork, of poultry, all the way down the list. And then you get to the next item. This is a tableware supply under this GL code, under this subcategory. Just like I have called out right here, I've got all my GL codes, all my categories, they're fully defined. If you would take the time and energy to go through your master product list and write or type in these two columns next to every one, what can come out of that is amazing. Most broadline distributors, most sophisticated distributors, if they can generate an invoice on a computer, they can take this information, they can plug it into, your, into their computer, and they can spit out an invoice that is automatically broken down into your categories, not their categories. They're going to default to their categories because they don't know yours because that customization is so different from one restaurant to the next, they have to have a rule for their accounting and they don't know your rule for accounting. If you give them your rule, they can generate invoices for you according to your GL codes. This has a huge impact when it comes to managing budgets, timeliness, accuracy, and let me give you a couple of examples. If I have a budget for my guys in the bar for $600 a month in bar supplies, every time we get an invoice, they can get a copy of the invoice and they can look at what their total was because it's already captured in one area, subtotaled in one area, and they can subtract that from their budget. So they know the day that they get the product exactly what the remainder of their budget is. That way, as an owner or a manager of a concept, I can make sure that my guys don't have an excuse of not being aware of where they were at on their budget. That way when they go over, they're accountable. If they went over and didn't get approval, they're also accountable. If they got approval, we made a note and it's known. And I can back that out when I notice the spike or the variance that caught me off guard. Additionally, there are many of these same companies that use a concept called EDI and that is an acronym for Electronic Data Interchange. An Electronic Data Interchange allows them to automatically upload a GNL sequenced invoice 
straight to your accounting platform. If your accountant is getting invoices electronically and they're already categorized and coded and they're already uploaded into the software for bookkeeping, regardless of what system it is, most systems have an EDI interface. Now, the timeliness to turn around P&Ls is a lot faster. The accuracy is a lot better. The manual operation and labor cost associated with that is now removed or minimized. This is a really, really important concept and one that I encourage all of you to use from just the initial benefit of being able to quickly look at your categories, add them up. You can go to your POS system and you can take your entire food sales. And before you even turn in your inventories, you can look to get an idea of what your ideal food cost should have been and what your actual food cost is probably going to be. Now there's no surprises, there's no waiting. If you're the chef or the general manager and you're getting incented on this, most good operators will keep an eye on this every single week. They'll add up the purchases for all cost of goods, they'll look at all their sales, they'll divide those if it's off, they'll break it down by food, by beverage, by liquor, and they'll separate those out. When you keep a rolling eye on what's happening, you get an idea of if you're gonna make it or not, if you've gotta tighten some budgets, if you've gotta be more methodical in how you're portioning, get back in there and coach your guys. All this is the stuff that helps impact that bottom line, make you more money and capture better food cost. So that is that one big concept. So all of this stuff that we've just gone through, these are the elements of accuracy. Quick recap, we had to go through and deconstruct everything to make sure that it had definition. And once we had defini definition and we've rationalized the concept or the product, now we can say where it has to go, which is its destination. And we want to continue to break that down as finite as we can so that we can always figure out where the anomalies or the inconsistencies come from. When we can identify them and know exactly why they happened or where they happened, now we have a better chance of controlling them. And when we can control them, we are impacting variance, that big 9% hairy monster that's kicking everybody's butt. We wanna get rid of that. Now, the final element of the best accounting practice comes from the way that we capture it. We've talked about the what, We've talked about the why, we've talked about the where and the how, and now we're gonna talk about when specifically we begin and end our cycle. In controlling the environment when it comes to taking inventory, one of the biggest mistakes that concepts make is capturing our inventory and running our end of months and P&L statements based on the calendar month throughout a calendar year. This is so incredibly flawed and so incredibly struggled with between the two sides of the restaurant operations or the restaurant ownership. We've got the operation side and we have the accounting side. Accounting does not necessarily fully grasp what's happened at the operations level. And if you haven't watched this, then most operations guys don't understand what's happening at the accounting level. Closing that gap is a challenge. Accountants prefer to do things on the annual based on the calendar month throughout the year because it's easy. That's how taxes are due, that's how uh, rent is due, but the convenience for them becomes an incredible burden on the restaurant, especially as it applies to variance. So here is the example. If I count my inventory and do my P&Ls according to the calendar month, I am bookending myself for at least three days on the wide side, four days of inconsistency. And that is because the calendar months are different. I've got one month of the year that's got 28 days. I've got five months of the year that have 31 days. Don't quote me on that. And the rest have 30 days. So what is the opportunity for inconsistency there? Well, take a look at this calendar. On this calendar, you can see that April 2017, April 2018, there was a pretty big difference between this year and next year. This year, I had five Saturdays in April. Next year, I only have four. So if I am looking at forecasting what my budget's gonna be, what my sales should be, how much I should buy, I'm gonna be off by the one day of the week that is personally my busiest, 
I will have just lost a factor of 20% of those busiest days now just went completely out of the picture. And if I'm not paying attention to it that way, I'm going to end up having a shortfall. Or I could have a false positive. If the truth was the opposite and we had four Saturdays this year and five next year, this year is going to look falsely positive, like we're growing, we're doing better than we have because this month over the same year, month last year, we're so much better. So the best in the business say, wait a minute, there's 52 weeks in a year. If I want to look at this accurately and consistently, then I'm going to divide that by four weeks. If I divide four into 52, I get 13 months or periods. And I'm going to do the same count it's always going to be, for example, Monday through Sunday. The first Monday of the month will start our first week of the period. Four of those in a block will represent one period. And the following will be true 13 total times. With that, now I have consistency. I'm comparing like for like, apples to apples. I have a controlled environment. Now, I'll give you a handful of other things that are critical. First of all, you don't have to start it Monday and end it Sunday. You can do it with whatever combination you want. Many places do it uh, starting on a Tuesday and ending on a Monday. It's completely up to you how you do it. Do what makes the most sense to you for accounting, for sales, for uh, efficiency, etc. But let's talk about some of the additional benefit that comes out of this. When I look at the advantages that this creates, number one is consistency. If I'm always doing it on the same day of the week, counting my inventory, closing out my books, then hopefully I built that in a way that is a slow day, predictably slow. I know we're going to be able to put the right attention and focus to doing it, and it's going to be the same attention and focus every single period, as opposed to running it on the calendar month. Last month, my inventory closed on Friday. I had to count all my product on Friday. Good news was I didn't have very much inventory because we were so busy. Thank goodness we're getting an order tomorrow. But now I'm going to have a very, very small beginning inventory. The next month, it ends on a Wednesday. Soft day. I can be more accurate. I can spend more time with my count. I've got a lot more inventory. So my average inventory value from a calendar month, one month to the next, are going to have big spikes. That variance is going to throw off the way that we read our P&L. Additionally, consider the quality of the count and who's doing the count. So if I am the chef and I'm responsible for the food inventory, what happens when inventory falls on a Friday? I guess I'm just stuck here till three in the morning. What happens when inventory falls on a Monday? That's the day I always take off. Now I've got to come in on my day off. Now I'm disgruntled or upset. Or I've got a really cool owner who says, hey, don't come in on your day off. I'm going to have somebody else do the inventory for you. Don't sweat it. Is there any accuracy between the person who counted it last time and the new person counting it this time? There's a whole number of reasons. These are some of the biggest advantages and some of the reasons where we see most of our people get that quick and easy buy-in to this concept because, oh my gosh, we're creating a controlled environment. It's going to be consistent. I can bank on that. That's a wonderful thing. So something to keep in mind. Next, let's talk about inventory cost itself. How we calculate the inventory as a formula can be a little bit challenging. So we went through the inventory value concept and we'll just repeat it again really quick. My beginning inventory value, how much value I had at the beginning of the cycle. Then I take that number and I add it to my total purchases and I subtract the total of those two from the value of how much inventory I had at the end of the cycle. That is going to give me that food inventory value. And with that, now I can figure out what my actual costs were because I can divide that by my food sales. And all of this concept leads us to the light at the end of the tunnel. Now I have sufficient accurate data to be able to analyze my business. Within this analyzation, I can do things like forecast. I can get an idea of what I should be able to sell this period over the last period because the trend has been running at the same clip. Maybe we're 5% ahead every month over month for the last 12 months. Now, because I have good insights that tell me that, I can assume that we're going to be 5% busier this period than we were the previous ones. 
that will help me with my scheduling. That will help me with my budgeting that I'm going to give to all my departments on how much they should spend. It's going to help me to isolate where I have challenges because now I have all this definition and that will ultimately lead me to the ability to impact things faster. Now, as far as analytics, when it comes to food cost, there are two more trainings uh, that will be a direct derivative of this. Analyzing and impacting food cost is a whole nother training because it goes into a lot of depth. I'm gonna cover some of it at a real broad level real quick before we wrap up, but I want you to have an idea at a high level how it works and hopefully we can create some interest to send you off and watch that video once it get posted. And the other video is going to be some of the mechanical elements of the other things outside of just this great accounting that impact food cost, the human error level of variance. And that's a big one. And there are a number of uh, crazy culprits and amazing fixes. So we're going to lead to that. But before we get there, let's just run through some analytics now that we get an idea of what we can do. Once I start running this controlled environment in a PL, I can look at how much I should have done versus how much I actually did do. If I see anything that's off, now in a timely way, with accuracy and accounting for budgets and everything being put in the right buckets, I can make intelligent comparisons that are in controlled environments so that I can isolate and identify and ultimately impact that variance through variance control. I can compare my sales to my budgets, I can identify where my deficits were, and I can drill down even further with my detailed P&L where I find some challenges. So in this really quick example, I wanna point out something that was just a little bit different. We missed our budget on our food sales by 0.9 or 9 tenths of 1%. However, we bought 1% more in food. So there's a 10% deficit in that run rate. Those two numbers should have been the same. If I missed the sales budget, it should have been the exact same amount that I missed on the food budget. And because I identified that, I decided to drill down. Once I drilled down, I found the culprit was I actually had a better rate of return on some new marketing campaigns that I did. Once I adjusted out those comps, it brought everything level and I realized I actually spent the appropriate amount on food, so I didn't require any kind of negative reaction. Um, so within the summary PL, if I do find those anomalous issues, I can drill down by looking through the detailed PL, and this is why and how we created all of these different categories, subcategories, definition, and rationalization. So that is a high level illustration of some of the things that we can start doing through analytics, and we're going to give you a lot more in the next video. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I really appreciate your attention, all the time you spent trying to master your craft and improve your ability to impact food cost. And again, remember at the end of the day, it's probably not a food cost problem as much as it is a profit problem. This entire construct leads to being able to manage profitability better by controlling spend and being aware of the ratios of revenue to spend. Now, when I talked about getting surgical, we're really gonna get surgical when it comes to that human element and what impacts variance so much in food cost. The big gap between what it was and what it should have been is oftentimes the lack of control in between. And that is gonna be revealed in this next video. Top 10 food cost killers. I hope you guys tune in and see that one. Pretty quick video, but very, very specific and detailed. We're gonna show you what the big impacts are and how to fix them with some of the coolest and most creative concepts that we've seen uh, in our years of doing this. So that's it. Thank you very much for hanging out. If you want alerts on when next videos drops, you've got to subscribe. If you've got feedback, good, bad, or otherwise, please throw it on here. I try to respond back to every single element of feedback personally. If you want to learn more about me, what I do, my team, you can check me out at bobryant.com. And finally, if you want to become professional buddies, you can check me out on LinkedIn, Ronald Bo Bryant. In the last two places, you can find a lot of different teaching, training videos, uh, access to my books, and all that type of stuff that's built in the same type of construct to be able to give you insights to go out there, kick ass in your job, and make big impacts immediately. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good one. See ya.